Thanks, Mike. All right. Good morning, everybody. How is everyone? Are we awake? Yes, good. All right, well, good to be here. Hey, uh, this year as a church, we've been praying that God might pour out his spirit on Australia, Sydney, Surrey Hills, that he'd wake people up who have no need for God, and that he might uh, give them saving faith, that we might see a revival in our day and in our generation. In the 15th century, one of the greatest revivals that ever happened in the history of our world happened in Europe, which became known as the Protestant Reformation. And five slogans emerged during that period, uh, Bible alone, faith alone, Christ alone, grace alone, gl- to the glory of God alone, which really captured the gospel. The medieval church was steeped in superstition. They'd lost the gospel. And into that moment, a group of Christians rediscovered the gospel and summarized the gospel like this, that how we know God is through the Bible alone, not through popes and priests and ministers telling us what they think. Uh, No, what does the Bible say? That's how we meet God. Faith alone is what we must do in order to be saved, not going to church, not prayer, not uh, paying, doing penance or anything like that. That's not how a person's made right with God. A person is made right with God by simply calling on Jesus to save them and turning from their sins. Faith alone. Christ alone is the Savior. Uh, no one else, not even yourself, is able to save. Uh, Christ is a, the wonderful Savior. Grace alone. Why is it that God saves me? Is it because he looks into my heart and sees, oh, Toby Neal's a pretty good guy? Or, no, <laughs> that's not what it is. Uh, it's that God from his own heart overflows with generosity and saves enemies. Uh, and then to the glory of God alone, because he does that. Not Christianity is, I was good, I'm enlightened, I believe the right stuff, I'm better than other people, that's why I'm saved. No, 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 if, if that's your gospel, then the praise goes to me. But if the gospel is he did it by his generosity and grace through the work of Christ, through which the only thing I need to do is claim Christ as my own, then he gets the praise, he gets the glory. And Al Stewart's going to talk about that next week. But here's the key. Why are we doing this? Tim Keller says that um, in a paper on revivals, he says, if you look at the history of revivals, the first mark of true revival is a rediscovery of the gospel. And that's what happened in the 15th century. They, these slogans summarize the gospel that they rediscovered. And we're praying for a revival, and it won't happen unless we rediscover and devote ourselves to the gospel. And so these five slogans are helping us study, cherish, love, and enjoy what God has done for us through Jesus. It's been good, hasn't it? It's been wonderful. All right, so today we come to the topic of grace alone. And uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. We're going to spend the majority of time talking about the problem which grace solves. Uh, The problem which grace solves. That we need a realistic view of ourselves uh, to understand why grace is so amazing. You know when John Newton wrote Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me? He, what he's saying there is you, you cannot understand God's grace and kindness towards you unless you realize how wretched, there's an old-fashioned word, but how devastatingly tragic your current situation is. And the sad thing is a lot of churches downplay our sin and our situation, and when they downplay our sin and situation, they downplay God's grace. So you want to be amazed at God's grace? Take a realistic view of who humanity is. So we're going to look at that in just a second. But for this reason, one of my favorite authors is Tim Winton, because he does just that. He takes a very realistic view of human nature in all of his works. Are there any Tim Winton fans out there? Three or four. All right. So a Amer- uh, Western Australian author. And the reason I like him is he's just so realistic about who human beings are. He's not sentimental. He's not shallow. He describes life and humanity the way they are in all their tragedy and beauty, in all their sin and all their grace. And in this novel, Cloud Street, there's this striking scene when Lester Lamb is out fishing with his teenage son, Quick, on the Swan River in Perth. And they're out there fishing. It's the middle of the night, and they're just reflecting on life. 
And Lester turns to his teenage son and says, I'm getting old and stupid and my family's ashamed of me. And reading this, we know that his wife lives in a tent in the backyard, that he hasn't slept in the same bed with her for years. And he's just pondering all of this. He's mid-40s and he's sharing with his teenage son that he feels stupid and ashamed. And his teenage son rushes to his defense and says, nah, nah, dad, no one's ashamed of you. You've done things. Aren't you happy with life? And Lester Lamb says, yeah, I've done things, boy, and I'm happy when I don't think about it. And as he says that, our mind's taken back to this moment where his neighbor is in desperate need. His neighbor drunk too much and was a gambler and got himself into significant debt and the bookkeepers are after him, his life's under threat. And so Lester puts him in his ute and takes him up north in Western Australia to this shack in the middle of nowhere, gives him supplies and leaves him there for a couple of weeks until the bookkeepers forget about him. And so very kind thing to do, takes him up north. And then on the way home, he drives home, he gets home, and the neighbor's wife seduces him and he sleeps with her and his conscience just gives him a drilling for the, for the rest of his life. He can't believe he did that. He feels so ashamed. And so he's out on this boat, this father reflecting on his own life with all these regrets, thinking, I, I feel like I'm stupid. I feel like my family's ashamed of me. I've done things and I'm happy when I don't think about it. And he's incredibly honest. And I like it because we can relate to that. That's the human condition. Winton doesn't sentimentalize or, or just cast on the uh, float on the surface he exposes the way that we can't even live up to our own moral and spiritual capacity uh, and that undergirds all of his characters now all great literature film and art does that kind of thing so you read tim winton you watch david fincher films uh, and they're telling us the world is not a rational place human beings do stupid strange evil things People aren't that decent, and if you look carefully, you'll see that you're not that decent as well. There are shades of grey inside every human heart, and that's the issue. And if you want to appreciate God's grace, you need to, first of all, appreciate who you were before He saved you. So that's what we're going to have a look at today. What were we before God rescued us and saved us? Secondly, what did God do? And thirdly, why did he do it? Answer, grace. But in order to appreciate grace, you've got to really plumb the depths of who we were. Because if we were nice people and God saved us, oh, he's pretty, you know, good on him. But if we were his enemies and he saved us, wow, that would be amazing. So we're going to plumb the depths of, uh, of the human condition. First of all, what we were. I'm going to spend my longest time on this. Uh, Tim Keller says, We all like the idea of God being gracious, that He's forgiving, that He's kind towards us. But God's grace uh, implies we have a problem. And so the problem's in verse 1 to 3. You've got a Bible, open up. Ephesians chapter 2. Remember, it's BYO Bible Month, and uh, it'll be great to bring a Bible. But this is what Ephesians 2 says. As for you, you were, so notice the tense here, he's writing to a Christian church. He's not telling them what they are right now. He's telling them what they were before Jesus saved them. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So if the grace of God is like a diamond, Verses 1 to 3 is like a black velvet cloth that you put the diamond on to see it sparkle brightly. So you're ready to go into the blackness? Three problems we're told here about human beings, that we were dead, that we were enslaved, and that we were condemned before Jesus saved us. Dead, condemned, enslaved. 
That's where he starts. As for you, you were dead. Now, that's the Bible's description of everyone in our world today without Jesus. Dead. They may look like they're living a wonderful life. They may feel like they're living life to the full. But the Bible says, disconnected from the God who made them, they are living a life of spiritual death. Death is their true position. Uh, Philip Jensen uses the language of cut flowers. So, you know, you cut some flowers, put them in a vase. They may look beautiful. They may start, the, the flowers themselves might start to bloom. But the flowers, once you've cut them, are dead. And just wait some time. The flowers will wilt. The, the petals will fall. The water it's in will start to stink. And just like that, human beings, we are like cut flowers. Some of you, you know, you're young, you're beautiful, very attractive Sydney ciders. But the Bible's description of us is we've cut ourselves off from God, the life source, and we are like flowers in a vase. For a moment, we bloom, and then slowly we decay. Spiritually, human beings, the people of Sydney without Christ, they may look handsome, they may look full of energy, but the Bible's description is they are spiritually dead because they don't know God. That's the first picture of who we are, dead. Secondly, enslaved. And at uh, verses uh, 2 to 3, we're, we're, taught, we're, we're led into this enslavement that we experience to three things, the world, the devil, and our flesh. First, the, uh, the world, we're enslaved. Verse 2, we followed the ways of the world. The world around us has a profound impact on us. The world keeps whispering, saying things. It, it gives us a way of looking at things which is contrary to the way God sees things. And our attitudes, habits, and preferences are profoundly shaped by what the world around us is selling us saying to us, and, uh, and we need to appreciate that. We are enslaved to the patterns of the world. But secondly, not only to the world are we enslaved, but we're also enslaved by the devil. Do you see that verse 2? We followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Who is that? That's the devil. The spirit now at work in those who are disobedient. And so by living a life independent from God, whether we know it or not, we've aligned ourselves with a supernatural evil spirit, Satan, the devil, who hates God. And by living our lives independent from God, we're doing what he wants us to do, not what God wants us to do. And we open ourselves up to his influence on us. Now, his influence on us, we, 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 ha we tend to have this very superstitious Hollywood view of how Satan uh, is at work in people's life. We think of head spinning, green vomit, and that kind of thing. But in the Bible, uh, the way Satan influences us is a lot more subtle and nuanced. And so one, some of the great uh, Christian preachers of old have used the, la the illustration of a... Oh, there's some flowers. Have used the illustration of a, of a piano. That Satan has no power to force me to do things. I'm not a slave in which he, 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 uh, I have no, uh, my will is not free independent of his. He can't force me to do anything, but he does influence me. And here's the illustration. If you have a piano and you sing a perfect note, say you sing perfect note of C and you sing it up close to a piano and then you run your hands along the strings of the piano, you'll start to feel one of the strings resonating, vibrating, and it'll be the string, it'll be the C string on the piano. And what's happening there is, <laughs> as you sing a pure note, it creates resonances with the strings of the piano so that it starts playing a note that you haven't even pressed on the piano. And the old preachers love this illustration of the way Satan has an influence in our own lives. Because Satan can't force you to do anything, but he knows the, your strings and all of us have different strings. But he, he'll often sing to us 
a tune, a note that 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 profound. That's our note. That that's how we express our independence from God. And as He sings that, our hearts go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me more of that. And that's humanity. We're looking at the black cloth on which the gem of grace is placed, and the black cloth of humanity is dead enslaved not only to the patterns of the world, but even to Satan's influence over our lives. He loves to sing to us. And we're like, yep, yep, I love that song, let's do that. But thirdly, not only are we enslaved to the world, to the devil, but we're also enslaved to our own flesh. Do you see that down in verse 3, that we gratified the cravings of our flesh and followed its desires and thoughts. Now, the flesh here is not uh, merely the body. It's the human person without God in their life. It's the natural human condition. And the flesh, who you are apart from God, has cravings which, notice, enslave us. Uh, And that word craving is a very important word. It's a combination of two Greek words, epi, thumia. Epi means over. Thumos means desire. And so what we have here, the, the, the over desires. Uh, our flesh craves, it has these over desires. Things we desperately need and build our life on. And so that's what our flesh is doing, over desiring good things. We crave some things which God has created, normal desires for good things, but these good things become ultimate things and they become epi-desires, over-desires. And they are often really good things. Things like the need for recreation, relaxation, comfort, sex, being useful, uh, the desire for power, love, affection. I mean, Beth just shared her desire for an overseas holiday, which is a wonderful thing. Nothing wrong with that. But when it becomes the ultimate thing in your life so that you're not able to fulfill the good things God's called you to do, it stops being a healthy God-given desire and starts being an ultimate controlling desire. And the Bible says we're enslaved not just to evil things, we're not just enslaved to Satan and the tunes he plays us, we're enslaved to good things which we lift up and become ultimate things in our life. I love that I didn't bring it up, but do I have it there? Yeah, Kids Church today made this beautiful craft. And uh, anyone teaching Kids Church today? No one here? But this is what my son brought home. And he's like, um, so here are idols, all classic idols. What's that? Buddha, Baal, Ashtora, something like that. And I had to write down other things which, look at this, get in the way of God. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, And so there are these things which hang over our lives, which get in the way of God. iPad, what did my son draw? His Nintendo, the TV, right? They get in the way. You know, that's a beautiful picture. So that's what we're talking about here. These, nothing wrong with Nintendos, iPads, whatever, but when they become, when they get in the way of God. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, Taylor Swift, right? So she's coming to Sydney next year, and I hear there's been a dog fight to get tickets. Uh, one of the two teenage girls in my household got tickets. So it's been a very sad experience in our household. But Evie, my, my middle daughter, my, my younger daughter, we were watching her documentary recently, Miss Americana. And the thing I was struck by was just how open and honest she was about the profound craving in her life for validation. I'll give you like four examples. She starts off by saying, I've been trained to be happy when I get a lot of praise. And someone, so she works incredibly hard. Someone says, hey, Taylor, you look really tired. Uh, I think you need some rest. She goes, no, I don't need rest. I'm fine. But then a minute later, she confesses, there's so much pressure going on, going into putting new music out. If I don't beat everything I've done prior it'll be deemed as like a colossal failure. You hear that? Uh, Do you remember when she was 17, she won Best Female Music Video at the VMAs, and she gets up and takes 
the VMA and Kanye West in a very unhealthy moment of his life takes the microphone and starts talking about Beyonce's music video. And um, there's Taylor, 17 years of age, and she reflects on that moment and how people started booing when, when uh, Kanye got on stage. And she said, at the time, I didn't know they were booing him doing that. I thought they were booing me. And she shares how that became such a profound moment in her life that she decided to move out of country and into pop. And she said, I'm going to prove myself. I'm going to prove I belong here. Then she wins... Uh, album of the year at the Grammys for a second time. And this is what she says after that. And I remember thinking afterwards, oh my God, that was all you wanted. You, and then she goes, you get to the mountaintop, you look around and you're like, oh God, what now? And then in 2016, Kanye West puts out the song Famous in which he says something offensive about Taylor Swift. She takes issue with it. And then the world turns on Taylor. And hashtag Taylor Swift is over party trends as number one on Twitter worldwide. Reflecting on that, she says, we're people who got into this line of work because we wanted people to like us, because we were intrinsically insecure, because we liked the sound of people clapping, because it made us forget how much we feel like we're not good enough. And I've been doing this for 15 years and it's just, I'm tired. It just feels like, it's more than music now, which it is. It is more than music. She's lifted up this ultimate thing, validation from her fans, and it's become an epi-desire, an over-desire, and it enslaves her. Right at the end of the documentary, she's in a recording studio, and she says to the, to the producer, I wish I didn't feel like there's this better version of me out there. And she talks about how hard it is to con constantly reinvent herself for her fans. This is what she says. Constantly having to reinvent, constantly finding new facets of yourself that people find to be shiny. Be new to us, be young to us, but only in a new way and only in the way we want. And reinvent yourself, but only in the way that we find to be equally, equally con comforting, but also a challenge for you. Live out the narrative that we find to be interesting enough to entertain us, but not so crazy that it makes us uncomfortable. So tired, like, she must be exhausted. Now, here's the thing. She's not exceptional in her yearning for approval. This is what all of us experience, and like her, when we live for approval, it becomes a cruel master. There's nothing wrong with approval, it's a good desire, but when it becomes an over-desire, it enslaves us, and we live for it, and we cannot rest, and we're never assured that we're enough, and you just see that playing out in this documentary. It's absolutely tragic. So there's the three enslavements that humanity have. We're sick, we're not sick, we're dead in sin, and not just dead, we're enslaved, to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And because of that, finally, we're under God's judgment. Look down at verse 3. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. We've dishonored Him. We've given our love to others. And He is rightly concerned about that. Now, that's who we are. In order to appreciate how amazing God's grace is, you have to appreciate how wretched we were. How wretched were we? Dead, enslaved, and under God's condemnation. Second question then is, and we'll move a bit quicker now, what then has God done? And look down at verse 4 to 7, because here's the incredible generosity of God. Verse 4, but because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable wealth of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So what has God done? He has taken the initiative. 
we were dead, he's made us alive. We were enslaved, he seated us in heaven. We were condemned, he's raised us up and received us into his presence. Just reflect on each one of those things. So we were dead, he made us alive uh, in Christ. Notice, in the, not in the middle of getting our lives back together, it's not like while we were seeking after God, God made us alive. While I was dead on the bottom of the ocean, unable to save myself, He made me alive. That's what He's done. Secondly, when I was enslaved, He seated us in heaven. Uh, so He's raised us up, seated us in heaven. Heaven is now where you are located as a Christian. Physically, Surrey Hills spiritually, you're in heaven right now because you've been united to Christ. And where is Christ? He's in heaven. And if you're seated in heaven, what do you think you're seated on? You're seated on a throne. What does that mean? Power, authority, freedom. And, uh, and so you've been raised and seated in heaven. That's where you are. You're reigning with Christ. No longer a slave to sin and Satan and, uh, and the world, but you've been set free to live for God, to love God, to serve Christ. And now you're a person who can say, your love is better than life. See, that's a Christian. A Christian is someone who's able to say, Psalm 63, God, your love is better than life. That's when you know God's made you alive. Because if you are able to say, hey, even when my investments, when they've crashed, doesn't matter because God's love is better than life. That's when you know you're free, right? Or when you lose your job and you're able to say, hey, it doesn't ultimately matter. Like I feel this, but it doesn't ultimately matter because his love is better than life. Or when you've lost a relationship, you're able to say, you know what? This pains me, but it doesn't matter because his love is better than life. That's a sign you've been made alive. You go from being under the power of the cravings of the flesh to be set free, to live for God. And you don't have these over-desires that enslave and control you anymore because the love of God is better than life. And notice the third thing he did. Not only were we dead, he made us alive we were enslaved, he seated us in heaven. But thirdly, we were condemned and he's raised us up to where? He's raised us to heaven, into the presence of God, not for condemnation, but for the favor, the love, the the commendation of God. He's looking at you with the light. And so this is what God has done. This is what Christ has done. You were dead, he's made you alive. You were enslaved, he set you free. And you were condemned and you've been received into the very presence of God. That is what he has done, yeah? Thirdly and finally, why has he done all of this? Is it because he looks down on our world and he sees in the heart of Toby Neal that although he's messed up a whole bunch of things and he falls short of a bunch of things that ultimately, actually deep down, now nah, he's a good person, I ought to save him. Is that what he sees? That's not what he sees. The black cloth is Toby was dead, enslaved, condemned, deserving of none of God's favor. If you're able to appreciate that, that therefore what God does for us is even more amazing. Right? Because if I help my daughter... And, uh, you know, she, my daughter doesn't stop. This is, this is life in the 21st century as a parent. My daughter doesn't stop texting me to transfer money into her bank account so that she can buy things, right? And I'm forever, okay, here's five bucks here, ten bucks here, right? Um, that's not that amazing. Like, she's my daughter. But imagine my enemy. Imagine if I had an I don't really have an enemy, right? But may, imagine I had an enemy and he's texting me for money. And I'm like, yeah, sure. See, that would be amazing. My love for my daughter is not amazing. It just goes with being a dad. But love for an enemy, that would be truly amazing. So you've got to appreciate 
Why did God do this? Not because he looked down and saw something in my heart. It's because, and if it's not in my heart, then it must be in his heart. What is in the heart of God that makes him send his son into the world to bear our sin, die, to save us? What must be in it is, is endless generosity. And that's what we read in verse 7. He did all of this in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. There is no other person in the history of the world who has shown grace to undeserving people like this. It's incomparable. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That's code word for how is God's grace shown? By giving his beloved only son to die in our place for us. I would never, ever, in a, in a million years, ever let my son die for you guys, right? <laughs> There's no way, right? I wouldn't do it. Uh, but that's because I don't love you, I, uh, right? But God, in his great love, graciously sends his son, who doesn't at all deserve what happened to him, to die for us so that we might experience what we don't deserve, to be accepted by God. 4 verse 8, it is by grace you have been saved, not by works. That's the key thing. Nothing in my life deserves this whatsoever. See, what is grace? Grace is a particular kind of love. A grace is when you love the undeserving. And that's God's love. That's why you've got to get the black cloth in order to see the diamond. If you put the diamond on a white piece of paper, oh, yeah, we're all basically naturally good. We're all kind of white, clean, okay. You don't see the sparkle of the diamond. But why God's grace is so amazing is because I was so wretched. We love to talk about God's love, and I think that's because um, love is often shown to people when you pity them. So, right, if a friend's um, mum dies, you buy them flowers. That was a loving thing to do. If a friend um, uh, loses their job, you take them out for lunch. You're loving them. You're showing them love. And I think we love to think about God's love for us all, God's love for us, because we pity ourselves and we think, oh, God just, he just pities us. And that's what, no, 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 no. You've got to understand this word grace. Grace is love for people who do not deserve it. That they've become, we've become God's enemies, and yet still, in the incredible generosity of His kindness, He saves His enemies, those enslaved, dead, and condemned. Grace means not only showing love and doing good to someone who you don't owe it to, but it's showing love and doing good to someone who you owe the opposite to. And that's what God owed us. The wages of sin is death, and yet instead of death, he gives us life because of what his son did for us. Before I wrap up, two mistakes we make. uh, No, let me just do one mistake we make with this idea of grace. The Roman Catholic view of God's grace is God's grace is like Red Bull. Uh, You jump out of, you know, a plane without a parachute, and uh, but if you drink Red Bull, it gives you wings, right? You know, yes, no, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, okay, cool. So God's grace is a little bit like Red Bull, and the idea is when you get baptized, uh, the Red Bull will give you wings. Uh, you can sin away the Red Bull and start to run out and plummet to the to death and hell. But the Roman Catholic view is, no, if you do penance, if you seek indulgence, if you receive the sacraments, baptism, the Lord's Supper, then you get more grace into you. It's like Red Bull. And on the last day, you'll be saved by your own cooperation with God's Red Bull. He gives you the Red Bull, and you use it to fly. If you fall, you can do penance, you can replenish this grace, uh, and that's the Roman Catholic view of grace. But the Bible teaches something very different to that. Grace is not a substance that you can kind of get or lose. Grace is a person. It's a way a person relates to you when you are undeserving and yet he still shows you his kindness. Grace is the person Jesus Christ. 
It's the way he relates to us. There's no thing that Jesus takes from himself and gives to us. The thing God gives you is Christ. And that is generous. You don't deserve it. And that's what grace is. Let me finish with a story uh, which I found quite helpful. Uh, It's one of those old preacher's stories. It's about a czar in Russia who has a friend who's dying, uh, and his wife's already died, and he has a young boy, eight years of age, and he comes to the czar and says, Czar, I'm about to die. Would you look after my son after my death? And the czar says, of course, friend, I'll do anything. And the, the father dies, the Tsar brings this boy into his family, raises, raises him as his own, adopts him, lavishes him with wealth and every privilege. The boy ends up growing up and going, becoming a soldier, a captain in his army, but he really struggles with alcohol, really struggles with gambling, and ends up amassing all of these gambling debts, so much so that he starts embezzling money from the Tsar himself in order to pay off the debts. So he starts wronging the czar who's always looked after him. Anyway, this, there's this moment in his life where he realizes just how much his sins are catching up to him and he can't hide it anymore and it's going to come out publicly and he decides to go into his tent and commit suicide. He gets the gun, puts it on the table and he starts drinking in order to mount the courage to kill himself. But he drinks so much that he passes out. <laughs> before being able to kill himself. And um, anyway, that night, the Tsar decides to take a a walk through camp. He dresses up as one of just the basic soldiers. And he walks around to get a view of the morale of the camp. And he finally comes to the tent uh, this adopted son was in. And he walks in and he sees all of the debts, all of the embezzlement, all of the way he's taken his own money and spent it on his own gambling addiction. And in that moment, he could have called the jailers in to lock him away, but instead of that, he writes a note for the young man and and leaves. And in the morning, the young man wakes up, looks down, and there's a note from the czar saying, saying, uh, saying, from my own personal wealth, I'll make good this debt. I'm good for this entire debt, signed the czar. And in that moment, this young man realizes the Tsar has seen me, seen everything shameful about me, and yet he still loved me. I don't deserve that love. I've wronged him, yeah? And yet he's shown me such incredible grace. That's a Christian. God creates us. We owe him everything, yet we've rejected him. We've lived independent from him, and yet moved by love and compassion for us, though we don't deserve it, sends his son into the world to bear our sins in himself on the cross that we might be made right with him. And he does that. He pays the debt. And in that moment, we realize how precious we must be to him. Despite being enslaved, condemned, and dead, he still graciously loves us. Not because we're lovely, not because we're lovable, but because He is rich in love. And when we realize how precious we are to Him, He starts being precious to us. See, grace motivates all of the Christian life. In light of all of that, how ought we to live? Let me leave you with these verses. Verse 9, verse 8, 9, and 10. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This isn't from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, recreated in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We live now for His glory and His honor because of how He has shown grace to us. More of that next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you so much thanks for your incomparable grace. No one else has loved their enemies the way you have loved us. We struggle to appreciate just how black the cloth of our helpless, hopelessness was. We like to think of ourselves as pretty good people, and yet your word shows us just how lost and dead 
and condemned we were. Father, keep us from having a shallow, superficial view of humanity. Keep us from having a shallow, superficial view of who we were without your grace towards us. Help us to see the blackest hues that we might appreciate your grace even more and therefore live for your honour and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.